Welcome everyone, welcome to uh, day two of Python ZA. Um, so, yeah, so today's talk would be by, we have two talks in the venue, and today's talk, the first talk would be by Jonathan Baojing. Bao <laughs> Sorry. Oh, That's okay. Jojo, one. and it's called Batteries Included. And yeah, he's a Brazilian, and he loves traveling. He's a freelance developer, and um, yeah, he's about to start now, so. All right, thank you very much. Hello everyone, good morning. Uh, I'm Jonathan Baldwin, or Jojo. People usually call me Jojo. Uh, I'm from Brazil, but I consider myself South African by heart now. I've been to Cape Town last year for PyCon, and since then it's my third time in South Africa, and I'm, I already have my flight tickets back in January, so I'm just gonna keep coming. I do love Cape Town a lot. Uh, woo! Uh, I'm a software developer, currently freelancing as a Python web developer. I really, really enjoy communities and conferences and meetups, not just Python, but like any kind of tech, dev, design-ish communities. I really love to participate and to be a part of that. Currently, I'm blogging to the Python Software Foundation blog. So probably I'm going to write an article about PyCon ZA. So if you have anything that you'd like to see on the article or something like that, just talk to me and you can like sketch some ideas. And also follow me on everything, mostly Twitter, at Jonathan Baldwin. Uh, I'm using mostly Twitter today, so if you want to see some rants, see some bad jokes, just follow me there. <laughs> so this is Batteries Included, and is a talk about the Python standard library. So everything that comes by default of the Python, every module, every function, every type, uh, it's considered the standard library. Hence the name Batteries Included. It is huge. It's like, damn, it's really, really huge. Uh, I've put this talk together, and it was the first time I rehearsed it. It was an hour and a half, and I was like, damn, I need to trim it down. So I remove a lot of things. Still, there are some nice modules to show, but it's not a comprehensive overview of the standard library. But Heather is uh, something that I want to give to you so you can like, be excited in your own adventures uh, going through the standard library and understanding and learning a little bit more. And there's no people required on this talk, so we're not going to be installing anything around. Uh, if you go to the Python standard library documentation, uh, it's kindly organized in five categories. So we have types, which is like strings, uh, lists, tuple, dictionaries. We have constants, which is true, false, none, ellipses. We have functions. Uh, there's like methods that you use, but you don't need to import, such as any, all, some, mean, uh, max. We have uh, exceptions, such as index error, import error, syntax error, and you have modules, things that you actually import. So this is the, how they organize the standard library in Python today. I'm going to be talking mostly about functions and about modules, uh, because it is too much if I put everything together, going to just stay here for like an hour and a half, so I needed to do that. So let's start it. First things first, this is a 100% live coding talk. So nothing can go wrong. So please forgive me any possible mistakes that are going to happen now. Let's start with anti-gravity. So you only type import anti-gravity and execute it. If the internet allows me, period, please. No. No, the perks. Oh yeah, now it's going. So when you type uh, anti-gravity, it opens the XKCD page and it loads a comic book from XKCD at some point in time. God damn. Okay, I'm gonna go back to this later. Uh, let me just import some constants here. Mm. Okay. Mwah. Let's that put put that on the on the end. So let's talk about functions now. So functions are uh, methods that you just use. You don't need to import. So I'm going to show you some of them, uh, so you can get an idea what is that. Uh, any and all, this is a really nice one. So if you have a line such like this, if 10 is bigger than 1, and 10 is bigger than 2, and 10 is bigger than 4, and it goes and goes and goes and goes, and say like, print, hooray, and execute it, you get the, you get the result, right? But if you have like this gigantic line of conditions, what you can do, you can do something like this. You can create a list of conditions, and you can just like choo -choo -choo, paste this here, and you see in your case a list of conditions basically. 
it's, it's a, uh, each item in the list is a condition. And if all the conditions are true, print hooray. So all, it accepts a list of conditions, and if everything is true, uh, it returns true. If some, at least when it is false, it returns false. Any, it's almost the same. So any is going to return, if at least one condition is true, it's going to return true. So instead of having like those gigantic uh, lines, or like uh, break the lines with a backslash, it's kind of ugly. So just, you can create a list of conditions. And like if you have some iterators, you can like just build this list over time and just test it once, which is pretty cool. So that's any and all. Deer, it's a really nice one. Deer tries uh, its best to show all the properties and methods from an object. So here I have this Pokedex variable, which is just a string returning Pokedex. If I type deer Pokedex, we're going to see that Pokedex has all these methods and some of their properties, some of them are methods, and I have everything here. If you type like some integer, for example, it's going to show everything about the integer. So when you're like exploring the objects and methods, you can just try to use Deer to see whatever you can use from that. It's pretty cool. But as I said, it tries its best because you can trick Python. If you define your own function, right, and if you define a a function called Deer, and you return something like, <laughs> and when you instantiate this, you say like, hey, it's my funk, right? My funk, and then you call Deer on A. <laughs> so like, you can trick Python. So it tries its best, but don't trust it blindly. Uh, it's nice. Uh, other nice things we have, we have the is instance method, this instance basically returns if uh, an object is instance of another object, if it's true or false. So if you say that Pokedex, Pokedex, it's a string, well, that's true. Is Pokedex a list? No, that's false. We have another constant here called IDs, and it is a list. And what's nice with instance that you can prove that everything in Python is an object. So if you type object here, oh, that's true. If you type if uh, an object is an object, that's true. If is instance is an object, oh yeah, that's true. So everything in Python is an object. So that's proven now. Other nice method is zip. So let me show here. We have IDs, which is like just a list of one, two, three. And we have some Pokemons. Pokemons. And it's the third, the three first Pokemons. If I want to, I can use zip to iterate for into multiple iterators. So if I type for ID and name in zip, IDs and Pokemons, I can print ID and name. And I can pass the amount of iterators that I want into zip. So I can like go to the first one in the first list, the second one in the second list, and it goes like that. But if I have like the type of this Pokemon, this type of grass, and if execute it now, you're going to see that there's an error because you need to unpack type as well. So you're going to see that it stops at the first one because it stops as the most short iterator. We're going to see how to fix that later, but keep that in mind. That's zip. And a nice, really, really nice addition to Python 3.7 is breakpoint. So before Python 3.7, you want to add a debug line on your code, you need to go these roots, which is, okay, you have a debugger, but then that's, that's a hard line to type. Your linter is going to explode in your face like, hey, why are you the same column? Why are you doing that? So that's kind of boring. In Python uh, 3.7, we have this thing called breakpoint. I'm going to show you in the console because it's easier. So when I type breakpoint, ta -da, I have the PDB running. That's just... That's just one line. I'm just going to stay here. Uh, the nice thing about breakpoints, not that it's just now one liner, you can control its properties. So if you have something like, uh, you can have something like this. There's this environment variable called Python breakpoints, and you can set it to a function. So if I set it to IPDB set trace, 
And now, when I execute breakpoints, breakpoints, I'm going to have the IPDB and not the PDB anymore. So you can control which kind of debugger you're using with uh, an environment variable. Uh, other nice thing you can do, you can set it to zero. And you can type IPython, and you can execute breakpoint, and it's going to do nothing. So sometimes, like developing the bugging and like trying to figure out uh, where things are, what you do, you put a breakpoint like all over code, and when when you use them, you just uh, set it like to the function you want to use, and you just want the program to run, set it to zero. So it's really really useful, and it's new in Python 3.7. Please update to Python 3.7. Uh, so this is about functions, but there is a lot of functions uh, in the Python standard library. This is the current on the Python 3.7 of the functions that exist. So you can go on the documentation and take a look in all. There's a really, really nice stuff around here. Okay, let's do some modules now. So modules is when you import the code. Uh, it is on the standard library, but you need to say that you want to use them. So let's go through some of them. First of all, uh, we have print, which is the pr printer uh, in Python. So when you type like print, I have this variable called Bulbasaur, which is there's a dictionary of information about Bulbasaur. So when you print, it's like it's kind of hard to read, right? Uh, and when you pretty print it, it's a little bit better. It's like if it is a nested data structure, it's gonna try to identify, it's gonna try like to break the lines and show something better to you. So like it's a little bit easier to read. Like it's not that easy because of the zoom on the screen now, but if you're like on your computer, it's very much better. But you can pass some nice things here. You can add some depth. So if I just wanna see the true depth of the data structure, I can use depth. Uh, and now like it's even pleas more pleasant to read. And you can do something like ident as well. And you can like ident your code a little bit to the right. So it's, it's a nice thing to do. So in your code now, what you're gonna do when you get home, you're gonna do something like that. Spring to receive the print. And then you're gonna be happier. Because then you can do like something like this. And it's the same. So do that in your, in your header of your file. Things are gonna get more pretty. Uh, let's talk a little bit about collections. Collections are like container types. So container types such like lists, dictionaries, tuples. Collections use those structures and build something on top of that. Like some more advanced dictionaries or like some counters or some stuff like that. Uh, today I'm going to show you two for you. Default dict and name it tuple. Pretty, pretty cool. So have you ever entered this situation? You initialize a dictionary. You go like into some names like iterative or something for n in Pokemons, and then you say something like this, name that append n, and then you have an error, because key was not defined. The dictionary doesn't know what name is. So you need to just go here, say like d name receives, I don't know, a list, and then it works. So d is gonna have like, true, d is gonna have a key with the three values. So you need to initialize this key, it makes no sense. Like why, if I want to add some age or add some IDs or add something, you need to initialize this key, this keys every time. Then you have something called default dict. So instead now of using a dict, I'm gonna call it default dict, and I'm gonna pass the list as a construct constructor. And I'm gonna delete this line. And it's gonna work. The thing is, uh, with default dict, every time you create a key, it's gonna have a default value, in this case a list. So I don't need to worry about like initially, initially, the initialization of my keys. I can just start using like uh, list methods on them without worrying about it. Even if I just type like some D IDs, for example, here, and I type oh, D again, you're gonna see that IDs is already an empty list. So you can pass like dictionaries, you can pass your own functions to return some different constructor. So there's a lot of nice things you can do with default dict. Uh, the other nice thing here is named tuple. This is like one of the things when you learn, like, damn, that's nice to learn about. So you have like Pokemon. Uh, sorry, you have Pikachu. Not Pokemon, I have Pikachu. So Pikachu is a tuple, okay? It has the ID, the name, and the type of the Pikachu. And when I want to access the ID, I need to type something like this. It's like, okay, I know the ID is the like first 
uh, item, but I need to type like zero and it's kind of weird. So you can have named tuples, which is basically a tuple with field, named fields. It's much, much more beautiful. So you can type like Pokemon, uh, receive the named tuple, then you type uh, like the class name of some sorts. So you have like Pokemon, and then you have your fields. So here I have this I ID, I have name, and I have type. And here with P, I'm going to create a new Pokemon, and it's going to have all the data from Pikachu. And I'm going to type P now. And now things look better, right? So now I have uh, the name of my class. I have uh, some fields, uh, like named fields. I can type p.name, which is pretty nice. I can, like, if I need to iterate over this data, I have something like as dict. So I can have like an, a dict of the fields and, and values. I can just like inspect the fields, for example, if I type fields, I know the fields from that structure. And it is a tuple, so it is an immutable data structure. So if I try to change the name of this Pikachu to my name, well, I'm going to get an attribute error. So neighbor tuple is really, really nice when you have like this small amount of data that you want to hold in a tuple, but you want to make it easier to use. But then in Python 3.7, oh, this Python 3.7 is amazing. You have things like data classes. Who here knows data classes? Some, some hands. Awesome. This is going to be awesome. So you have data classes. This is like a talk by itself. So I'm just going to like skim over it, and you can jump on the documentation later. So data classes is the following. Here's I have this Pokemon class, right? And I just have this init method to set some attributes on this the instance. So if I have my P again, Pokemon class, and I pass the Pikachu, and I have P. <laughs> this is ugly. <laughs> oh my god, this is ugly. Like main Pokemon class, that's some weird name. Like what is happening here? And like to define this, like I can okay, okay, I can call like p dot name, okay, that's nice. But to define this, I have like this init method. I need to set the self things. And like, damn, I just want a class that I can say p dot name. I just want the name of my Pokemon. Then it comes something really, really nice: data classes. Data classes are classes, normal classes, but they were born to hold data. That's like the main purpose of the class. So you define something like this. Use this nice decorator, data, class, data classes, data class. And let's define here Pokemon, data of DT. And look at this, it's amazing. Call ID int, name, string, and type string. And that's it. Before I go, just, just let me show you another thing here. If I type P equals equals Pokemon class dot Pikachu here, this should be true because they're basically the same thing, and it's false. With because uh, this equality of Python each define like the dunder equi equi method, and you need to define all these things by yourself. And like the bad representation is because you don't have a wrap representation method on your class and everything. But when you have uh, data classes, things gets a little bit nicer. So my Pokemon now is a Pokemon DT. And I'm going to pass all the data from Pikachu. And look at this. Huh? It's beautiful. I don't need to define an init method. I, have, I already have the type hints. And type hints are required here. So data classes always need the type hints. And I have this beautiful representation of my data. I have some methods defined. So if I try this equality thing here with the Pokemon DT, you're going to see that it's true. So it's already defined an equal method for me. And you can, it can, like, you can do so much in this thing. So you can have something like this. You can define a default value on your data. Uh, and like if I construct one now without the type, it's going to be grass by default. And other things you can do, you can type like frozen equals true here. Uh, frozen, is that correct? Frozen, yeah. And if I type like p.name receives Jojo, it's going to give me an error. That frozen, frozen is not defined. Oh, damn. It's going to give me an error like frozen is error. So, like, I can use a class uh, with a bunch of data. I can froze, like, as a tuple of some sorts. Uh, I can define methods. I can, like, do inheritance. I can do anything as a normal class does. But now I have this uh, 
more vivid explanation of what a data class is. And if you have like some numeric data, you can also uh, add uh, attributes to define like the sum, uh, the methods like uh, comparison. You can like sum uh, data inside the class, and it's going to return like for you a beautiful, nice class with the sum data. So it's really, really nice. I recommend anyone to go into the document. There's a really, really nice talk uh, by David Bessler. I don't remember his name correctly, but he goes like through all the things in data classes, and it's amazing. So these are data classes. Uh, let's do some path things. So pathlib uh, is a library to deal with directors. It's like cross-platform, so you can use it in Linux and Windows and everything. And it really, really is it's better than use OS to do that. So path, if I just like path slash etc, and I type p. So I have a POSIX path, because I'm in a POSIX operation system. If you use Windows, maybe you receive like a Windows path or something like that. So you can have different things here. Uh, nice thing is, uh, if I want to show everything in, in this path, I, can, I have this method called iterdir, and I have everything in my etc now, just with a really, really nice method. Now comes like the, the, the nice part. I have this ntp file, right? I'm going to call path slash ntp.conf. Look at that I'm using the slash, like the thing that you like use to divide numbers, and now you construct a new path using the slash. This is, this is amazing. And like, I have this NTP and I call, hmm, is this a file? Like, yep, it is a file. And I can call, give me just the suffix of this file. Oh, is that conf? It can like, give me just the sting of this file. It's just NTP. So you have these nice things to go through, the, go through your uh, director structure, go, like, go about files and about directors. Uh, directors, and you can also say something like, hey, can you read this text for me? And it's going to read the text for me. So it's just about dealing with direc uh, directories in a really, really nice way. And like this for me is the winner. Like if I can construct a path like this, like just that for me is already amazing. So they basically they overload the div methods on the class, and it says like, hey, when you're slash, just puts paths together, and it's become this beautiful pattern here. Nice. Doc tests. Doc tests are nice. Damn, they are nice. So doc tests is like when you document and test at the same time. I'm going to go to the console to show this one, because it's easier. So I have this multiply function. It's just a function accepts two parameters and returns the multiplication of these two parameters. The nice thing in this function, this is doc string. Look at this. So you have basically like Python interpreter lines. You pass like this beginning of the interpreter. It was assigned two variables. Uh, you call the function, you know it's returning 10. Uh, because when you do something like this, so from multiply, import multiply, and you call, multiply, you call like multiply, multiply, 10, true, you're going to return 20. So like it's just basically doing that, calling the, the function. And if I use this Python dot m doc test doc test, and I pass the file like multiply dot pi, you're gonna see there's nothing. But if I pass like verbose just to see what it's doing, you're gonna see that it runs those tests. The things inside the doc strings was treated as tests. The interpreter execute, executed those lines. And like it's, it tries to do this and expected nothing. It tries to multiply and expected 10 and it was okay. And when I try to pass three parameters, it uh, returned me a, a type error. And like I had a test for that. So every test passed and everything is fine now. So the thing is, when you have like these small functions or you have like a really, really small uh, piece of software and you don't need like to write to mock or do something that unit test does. You can just use these doc strings uh, with doc test, and you have like tests on your functions. It's really, really tight. Your function is closed. You can see what's happening. It's, it's very nice. So give it a try. It's very, very nice. Uh, let's go to some inspect now. So inspect, uh, it's using to it's looking into live objects, things that's already defined in your code. So I have this method called catch the null. It has some args. It has some type annotations, some docs and returns your string. So with inspect, you can do things like that. You can like get source, source, and then you 
pass like cache the null in here. And then I have the source and a string. Well, that's pretty cool. So if you have like if you need to inspect some function that was defined by the user in your API, you can just like read the whole function. You like if you wanna build a linter that takes a look into in docs were defined or not, you can get that doc and it returns the documentation. You can like have the signature of your function. So I have this. Uh, you have this thing called a signature. So it's how the function was built, its arguments, its name, uh, its returns, type annotations, and everything. So for example, you can have sig.parameters, and you have all the parameters for our function. And you can like b, has have sig.parameters.get b, b, and you have the b parameter. And with b, you can know like, hey, what is the annotation of that? And it's an int. So you can like drill down inside the function and see what's happening, and like you can make comparisons. You can make like I don't know. Can if you need to look at this uh, li type of live code and uh, do some assertion or like see if everything is fine, you can use inspect. It's pretty nice. Uh, time it's time is very nice. Uh, time it's is time is small bits of code. It's not a profiling tool. It's not like something that you're gonna use for a bunch of metrics. It's your time small bits of code. So here, uh, we have these two things. We have a list comprehension that goes into a range from 0 to 99 and multiplies it by 2. So it returns this. It's a list, blah, blah, blah. And you have this thing here, which is the same thing, but in a map. So in a map, it has a lambda, and it like all this weird stuff. And it's harder to read, and it's awful, but it returns the same thing. And then you think like, hmm, what is faster? What is best to use? A list comprehension or a lambda and then like cast it to a list? And then you use Python time it. When I use like this exclamation mark in a Jupyter notebook, it means that I'm executing like a, a Unix command. So I'm basically going to the terminal and write like typo, blah, blah, blah. But so I don't need to go there. I can do it here. So here's I have the time it. So I'm invoking the model time it. I'm saying, hey, like, do. 50,000 loops and execute this piece of code, the same piece of code. And I just run it. So, and uh, list comprehensions are faster than if you do a map and if you put in a list afterwards. Uh, it's actually uh, really, really fast. And you see it tries like the best of five. So it runs like five times, it grabs like the, uh, the, smaller, the smaller time and it puts here. So sometimes you have like a class and you want to instantiate the class. If you want to see if this way is better than this way, or if you have like a list comprehension on a map, or if you have like a filter, a reduce, or you want to like do something that you can do like in two or three different ways and you don't know which way is better, you can use like really, really quick time it. Just put, the, just put whatever you need like in between um, quotes here and it's going to time it for you. So use list comprehensions, don't use map with lists. Uh, here we have iter tools. So iter tools, it's a collection of like uh, functional tools in Python. So you have like things like repeat, uh, cycle, you have like this. It's basically everything goes around iterators. So like you can use iterators uh, in a better way with Python. It's a gigantic model. If you go to the documentation, like it's really, really big. I just grabbed like three of those to show you uh, what you can do with that. So for example, I have repeat. So for n in Pokemons, uh, in repeat Pokemons, I'm going to pass 5 here. I'm going to print n. So it's going uh, to do this loop 5 times. If I don't pass 5 there, it's just going to crash my, my kernel here, and it's going like, to repeat it forever. And I have things like that. I have repeat to repeat something for a specific amount of time. I have cycle, so like you can cycle for the same loop a bunch of time. You have things like that. Uh, other nice things you have is chain. So suppose you have like a bunch of lists and you want to like just go through list and list, or, like all the lists and you want to like write a bunch of for loops. You can use chain. So for like for E in chain, and then I can pass here IDs, Pokemons, and Gross, and whatever, dudes, Vape Nation. And then you can like print. 
I love it so much. Uh, you can do it, and it's going to iterate in every iterator. So I is going to be one, two, three, and then it's going to be uh, the items of Pokemons and grass, and like it's going to go every, uh, each character of this list, and it's going to print it here. So that's the chain. And remember that I told you about that zip problem that you have? That's grass like uh, made things worse. So we can fix with zip longest. So we're going to have the same thing. IDs, names, and types for zip longest. IDs, Pokemons, and just grass. Just grass. And we're going to print E, N, and, N, and T. Hmm. For E. In zip longest, what is wrong here? What is wrong here? Someone help me, please. No, that's not it. It can be. No, oh, invalid of base 10 grass. Oh, good time. Pokemons. Uh, let me try like just this print E and N. I'm gonna remove this T from here. Ooh, I did some really weird things somewhere. <laughs> God damn, what is going on here? All right. So basically, what zip longest does, uh, I can I can do something like this. I can try the the restarts the kernel. Oh, no, I don't want to ruin everything. No, no, no. Okay, stop it. So I can uh, blah, blah, blah. Look, it's here. Oh, nice. This is fixing a live coding thing. Uh, so now I'm going to pass the type again. So what it does here, uh, it's this, uh, basically the same thing with zip does. But if uh, the iterator, like the shortest iterator is done, it's going to just attribute none. Uh, somewhere in here you can pass like a default value if you don't want to use none, but then you can like have like tables or have like concrete data. At least you have something in there to put it, and it's not like just ends in the middle of the thing. So this is iter tools. It's like functional functions for your Python, and functools is like m more functions, like even even more functions, which is basically functools. They have functions to apply into functions. So like you basically all functions like return other functions, you can manipulate functions or like improve functions or decorate functions and do things with functions. So here we have the partial. Remember multiply? Remember multiply, if I pass 10 and 40, it's going to be return 400. I c with partial, I can do something like this. Multiply. Multiply 4. I can have a partial of this function, multiply, and I can pass the first parameter. My god, if I can type, as 4. So what multiply by four returns? It's a function. So it returns like the same, the first function, the multiply, and the first parameter is four. So what I can do now is just call it with 10. And I have 40. So it's multiplying by four. So I'm just basically getting a function, putting inside another one, and like passing some arguments to that. And I can do something like multiply by four and 10. So partials, multiply by four and 10. And now it makes no sense anymore, but it works. So like you can have this, which is two partials. Like so, multiply by four and ten. It's this multiply with these two arguments by default. So basically, it's like constructing another function. It's pretty nice. It's there. It's nice. And oh, oh, the awesome thing about uh, functions is this LRU cache. So I uh, here I'm using URL lib. lib Please don't use requests. Uh, I'm kidding. Use requests. Don't use this. <laughs> Look at this to make <laughs> to make a request. <laughs> oh my God! So much trouble. Okay, but it, in, in, for the sake of the better ones, include them using your lib here. And this request is basically just making a request uh, and returning a JSON. So I'm going like to the poke API API and returning something, the content of the page. But I'm decorating with this LRU cache method, and this is awesome. Look at this. I need to get it. So it's going to take a bit, because it's going there and making the request. And the internet is probably not going to help me too much. And we have this request uh, cache info now. 
we have these methods in this function. Please work. No. I'm very fine. Okay. Really? I'm just gonna keep watching this. Oh my god. Yeah. Let me just switch back here. Internet's not happy, internet. Let's try. Oh nice, awesome. So uh what it does, I made a request, return the content, and now I have this cache info. The, the method has this cache info. What it does, it has like zero hits, one misses, and the max size and the current size of the cache. So basically, what I'm passed to the rack uh, function is an URL, of course, and this URL is being hashed, and like there's a hash of the URL and the content. And every time I call this URL with the same uh, parameter, it's gonna return the same, possibly return the same thing, and then I'm gonna have this then I'm going to have this cache now. So every time I say, look how fast it is now, it's fast. Because I'm hitting the cache, I'm not doing any requests anymore. And like if I just go and do another one, Pokedex, for example, and I got it, now I have two misses because I didn't have the Pokedex on my cache. But I, if I execute that like a thousand times now, it's going to be really, really fast. So if you have something that's always return, like with the same parameters, it returns the same thing. It can be like a function that does some like weird computation thing, or it can be an API that always returns the same thing. You can use just one decorator and like save a lot of time in I/O, in networking, whatever. And you can define like this max size of this cache, so don't blow your memory up. Uh, you can like just do like rack, rack dot cache clear. Uh, you can do like rack dot cache inf. And then it just clear everything, so we have these nice things. It's just one decorator it can prove like a lot of performance in your code. So this is nice. Pico rig. So Pico is really really nice. What Pico does is like what JSON does. So JSON serializes like Python data structures into JSON. Pico serializes Python data structures in bytes. So if I have like Pico dot dumps. Dumps, and I pass like Pikachu. You see, this is a tuple in bytes. And what we can do in bytes? You can like send bytes to network, you can write bytes to files, you can do things with bytes. So if I have something like this, if I open a file called Pika uh, in a write plus bytes way, I think that's it, as file. And I write in this file this thing here, right? So I have this file now. If I see the contents like in my shell, this is like uh, Python stuff in bytes written to a file. But the nice thing is that I can do like with open pika. I'm gonna just read now in a bytes format as file, and I can like this variable called pika is gonna return the pico it loads, and I'm gonna read the file, and I'm gonna print this variable. Ta da! What I did. I save the file, uh, get a variable, a tuple, I serialize it, save it in a file, read this file, deserialize it into variable, and it works. So why are you going to use that? I have no idea, but this is awesome. So it has some, it has some caveats, like this is nice when you have a queue and you want to send some uh, Python data structures, and like you just can send like bytes or something like that. So like you condense everything in bytes and you send over the network, which is cool. Uh, it has some caveats, like if it, you can do some really, really weird things with this, but it can like backfire. So read the documentation really carefully and like don't go crazy and pick a rig, but it's, it's really nice. So we're getting to the end. Uh, platform is really nice because it tells what your computer is. So I have like platform dot, uh, your name. This is the best one. It basically investigates your computer and returns information about it. So sometimes you're like doing some uh, management uh, computer tool and you want to understand if like it's a Windows, it's a Mac with a version, uh, the nodes of the computer. Uh, you can do some things like uh, platform.python. Look at this, you have lots of information about the Python. So you, uh, you want to see if the Python version that you're using is whatever part it is. You can type this and you can like understand a little bit better your platform. So this is really simple, it's really like OS can do almost, I think OS or CIS can do like almost the same thing, but it's 
more work, and platform just wraps everything about the information about your computer into a really, really nice API. So that's nice things about this under library. So I don't want to show the secret. So JSON tool is amazing. So you can use JSON to serialize and deserialize uh, Python data structures into and from JSON, right? But this is a secret thing called JSON tool. So this is like I'm, I'm in my terminal. I see this JSON file, and it's like horrifying to read. And what do you do when you want to like pre-print some JSON in your console? You do like Python, that's n, JSON, that's two. Yeah, look at this. Damn, that's beautiful. Now, like you can just do it in your console. Like you can just use Python to like make JSON pretty again. So like this is the standard library. This is the beautiful of this. It's like it's standard library. You just use it. It's amazing. So uh, JSON that too. And the ice in the cake is HTTP server. Oh, this is amazing. So let me show HTTP server. So like you want to share your, some files with your friends, like in the current network, and like, oh, give me two minutes. And I'm going to, uh, and you like want to share some files with your friends in the network, and you can type like python.mhp.server, minus that here, and uh, a thousand, and then you open, and it's boom. You have like, you have a network server with a command line in your show, and that's really, really, really awesome. Just to finish this talk up, this is the standard library. It goes a little bit like this. So when I say it's huge, it's huge. So take your time, go through each module, every module. That's their homework now. You need to go to anyone and test every one of those. Yeah, it's a little bit big. Uh, if you want to know more, there's the documentation. It's pretty cool. There's a Python module of the week. Which a guy took like some modules and make it nice, really word, nice uh, real world examples. And the source code is on GitHub, so like you can inspect things uh, about the source code. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want to talk about this in the library or anything, please talk to me. This is the link for the notebook. There is another big one there as well, like with the one hour and a half talk that I needed to trim down. Uh, follow me on the internet. I love people. And bye. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget the Zen of Python. Yeah, um, so thank their you. library as well. Okay, sorry, you okay. can go now. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. So we have uh, time for one question. So one question. Good. It's worth a Microsoft a hundred dollars something from Azure. <laughs> He's gonna give you some money. <laughs> Try to sell it somewhere. In your Powerflow Powerflip example, you created a path with a uh, forward slash. Is it like ospath.join platform agnostic? Mm, good question. I think so. Uh, let's, let's do some research here. That, that's how you answer a question in real life. You just go on the internet and find the answer. <laughs> so you go Python standard library, and then you find the path lib thing. Let's see. So I have like a lot of things here. Let's see some Windows things. Windows, Windows, Windows. Uh, look at this. I think you can. I think you can. Yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. So you ha we have an answer there. Yes, you can. So yeah, you can. Yeah. Thank you. I sent all the things in the search. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>